I'm Bengt Matson, uh, co-chair of the Inter, Inter Association Initiative on Pharmaceuticals in the Environment, and I'll run through this slide deck uh, for you today. Uh, just before I do that, let me just once again uh, underline that this is a joint initiative by the Self Medication Trade Association (ASGP), the Research Based Pharma Association uh, (FPA), and uh, the Association for for Manufacturers of Generics and Biosimilars Medicines for Europe. So this is really a joint industry initiative. Uh, I'll that. Uh, today's agenda, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will be the following. Uh, I'll try to set the context first to, uh, to show you how pharmaceuticals could uh, end up out in the environment. We'll talk a little bit about uh, policy within the European Union. Uh, and then, uh, which is the, the main purpose of this presentation, of course, is to give you a, a, an insight into the proactive holistic industry proposal that we've come uh, that we've developed the pharmacal stewardship. I'll present the three different pillars we have: uh, one part called the IPI project, one around manufacturing of effluent management. Uh, or, or management of manufacturing effluents, uh, rather, and then uh, I'll go through the extended environmental risk assessment scheme. And uh, that'll take roughly tw uh, 30 minutes, and then we'll open up for a QA session of roughly uh, 30 minutes. And uh, if time allows during that session, uh, I'd like to, to, uh, to have a little discussion around transparency in the uh, supply chain which is a, a, a hot topic where a lot of our stakeholders keep on coming with some criticism so that, that might be one of the the topics that i would very much uh, have you insight into when we come to the q a session if time lasts so, so starting out with uh, setting the context on, on how pharmaceuticals enter into the environment, I guess this is probably nothing new to any one of you. In the lower part of this slide, uh, we have the, the, uh, the scheme for, for veterinary medicines used in farms. Uh, the top part of the slide is more directed uh, towards the human medicine and a lot of the work uh, that the uh, joint initiative pharmaceuticals environment with industry trade associations focus upon are the human medicine side and i usually say there are three major pathways into the environment of human medicines uh, one potential way of course could be releases from industry uh, manufacturing operations uh, we have the uh, the uh, use phase of course excretion from patients with metabolism of course in in the, in the patient body through excretion and through the the wastewater uh, systems through through a treatment plant ending up in the the, uh, the receiving water bodies uh, in the environment a third potential uh, pathway to the environment would be through uh, disposal of unused uh, medicines uh, there are mainly three potential ways uh, people uh, could dispose of their unused medicines. Bring it back to pharmacy, some kind of a control destruction uh, pathway where we incineration of that uh, waste through household waste, which either would go for incineration or to a landfill. Some countries use that as the, the preferred way. And then, of course, people could potentially uh, dispose of their unused medicine through through the toilet or the sink. And a lot of the the uh, the work we've done is around making it very clear for 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 patients and consumers that they should not flush their their unused medicines down the toilet or in the sink. And as you you've seen, there is a uh, there is a, uh, a campaign uh, we are running, uh, Meds Disposal, uh, 
on, on uh, trying to increase their awareness. So, so mainly three different pathways. Uh, and the best estimation we could have is that natural excretion uh, stands for roughly 90% of the pharmaceuticals substances ending up in the environment. Improper disposal of unused medicines, uh, let's say five to ten percent, and then there is a a small fraction that could come from manufacturing effluents. And uh, we believe it's very small in uh, inside Europe, but in certain places around the world, at least from a local perspective, this could be a a a, a pathway that that needs to to be address because it, it could potentially have have negative impact at least on a localized scale. But it's important that everyone remembers that national excretion from patient stands for the, the vast majority of, of the APIs entering into the environment. And then coming back to, to, uh, to the important question, the scale of these problems, are our waters safe? And we are very strong. Yes, they are. There are very, very low concentrations found in the environment. In many cases, well below, uh, well, well below the, the uh, therapeutic dose. And uh, there has been no adverse impact risks uh, for humans recorded or identified. And the World Health Organization, WHO, said on, on 2012 that, that they do not see uh, a, a, a potential risk for humans, at least not acute ones. But we do need more data when it comes to, to long-term impacts, especially on the aquatic wildlife. And, and uh, <coughs> One, one point of, of uh, discussion is, will always be that uh, several of our substances, the APIs, degrade uh, pretty slow in the environment. They, they, are, they are stable, some of them are, are potentially persistent even, and by concentrations may grow over time. So, so let's jump into the policy environments the, here in the European Union. And uh, uh, here we list some of the, the applicable uh, legislation or regulations we have to, to cope with. Within the pharmaceutical legislation, we, we have the requirement of an environmental risk assessment being, being uh, uh, produced and, and delivered to the, to the agencies. Uh, when we, we seek approval or market authorization for product. It's extremely important to remember that uh, that environmental risk assessment is not part of the, of the uh, risk benefit evaluation for human medicines. So, and it couldn't stop marketing authorization of a human medicine. On the veterinary side, however, the environmental risk assessment is being part of that risk uh, benefit evaluation. Uh, the, pharma, uh, the pharmacovigilance directive uh, requires the European Commission uh, to, to produce a report on the scale of the pharmaceuticals in the environment issue. And, and uh, that report, I'll come back to that a little bit, was, was presented uh, a few years ago now uh, by, by uh, in, in principle, the Commission, of course, but in principle, the DG Sante, since the pharmacovigilance directive is, is within the pharmaceutical legislation. In the Water Framework Directive, however, which is an environmental uh, regulation, uh, it has been, uh, it's very clear that a strategic approach should be developed by the Commission. And here, the DG Environment. Uh, had taken the, the lead since it's part of, of Water Framework Director and the, the environmental legislation, so to speak. And uh, also within the, the uh, Water Framework Director, uh, there is also a, a so called watch list uh, uh, developed uh, where uh, a few of our uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients have been, been included, where new states are required to monitor 
once again somehow help to define the scale of the also like to mention the industrial emissions directive which covers manufacture uh, operations within the European Union and uh, in, in this case pharmaceutical substances could of course be regulated within environmental permits and, and, uh, and these kinds of, of, uh, of measures as any other type of, of uh, uh, emission or release from manufacturing operations. And finally, we have um, within the national legislation of, of uh, all member states in the European Union, there's regulations on the disposal of unused and expired medicines through different uh, national collection systems. There is not one harmonized uh, model for, for coping with unused and expired medicines. It's up to each member state to set up a, a collection system that, that works well uh, for that member state. Uh, I would like to give you some some uh, some feeling for the external uh, stakeholder concerns uh, and the potential risk for for, for our industry. Uh, stakeholders advocating for for regulatory measures. They talk about re retrospective enforcement of environmental risk assessment testing, which could lead to reauthorization of products. Something that we do not uh, want to see. Uh, stakeholders has also talked about uh, that they would like to see environmental standards as part of the good manufacturing practice uh, regulation. Uh, we do not like that because that might uh, compromise the intent of GMP, which is to secure product quality and patient safety globally. Uh, there is also stakeholders that voice that they are just about having environmental criteria for market authorization, meaning that the environmental risk assessment should be also for human medicine based uh, be part of the uh, risk benefit evaluation. And that's a, an absolute no-no for us since that potentially would delay or even deny uh, patient access to valuable medicines. So the strategy when it comes, uh, the timeline when it comes to the PI strategy uh, being developed in the European Union. Uh, back in 2014, the first biointelligence survey uh, report was, was produced where, where this cons consultant presented a whole range of different possible uh, uh, initiatives that could be taken to, to try to, to, uh, to handle pharmaceutical environment. Uh, it has been updated uh, and, and uh, a roadmap for pharmaceutical environment is to be presented by, by commission um, as we speak, uh, sometimes now in April, it's expected to be that far. That'll probably adjust uh, perhaps a little bit even more the BioIS report, which then will be the be presented uh, and in summer we, we believe we'll see a, a some kind of a revised list of policy options uh, and in fall we'll uh, hope to, to see uh, or, or to be part of a public uh, consultation on this which will then lead to a final uh, uh, report being being uh, developed and, and presented in the end of the year, allowing the European Commission to, to publish their PI strategy, pharmaceuticals and environment strategy, by the beginning of 2017. And that will form the basis for, for any uh, measures taken on, on uh, pharmaceutical uh, environment, which may, of course, include uh, different uh, regulations. So what, what we've developed and which could be seen as our contribution into the PI strategy, and we, we hope that that Commission and, and other stakeholders acknowledge the value we believe this, this actually brings. There's a lot of, of good ideas developed within the framework of eco-pharmacy stewardship. And I'll, I'll go, run through this uh, together with you. 
uh, in a nutshell, it's, it's a holistic program that, that has some kind of a life cycle approach to address these different environmental concerns with a very, very strong, strong uh, intention to secure patient access to medicines. It's based on product stewardship, it, it's partnership, it's uh, on shared responsibility throughout that life cycle. Uh, it is built on evaluation, re-evaluation and reassessment of environmental risks uh, throughout the life cycle. And as I said, work sharing and partnership uh, throughout the, the, uh, the life cycle. And if we, we look on that, that life cycle, manufacturers, ourselves, of course, we, are, we have certain responsibilities uh, within that life cycle. Distributors, physicians, pharmacists, hospitals, users, wastewater treatment facilities also have to, to, to do their part to, to, uh, to allow a, a reasonable and good management of, of, of the pipe issue. And for us, we've identified three uh, areas uh, which we think are, are vital from our point of view. Uh, the IMI project called IPI, I'll come back to that one. I'll talk about manufacturing, the management of manufacturing effluents. And the third pillar, uh, the extended environmental risk assessment, which we believe if, if we address those things and the other stakeholders address their parts of the life cycle, we believe there is there's good opportunities to, to manage the, the pie issue. So as I said, three pillars. Uh, the IPI project uh, is, is our way to, to, uh, to address some old products, what we call the legacy products, without environmental data, as you probably is aware of, uh, products that were authorized before 2006 very rarely have full environmental data sets. So we, we have a backlog there, but we need to prioritize those legacy products to, to see where focus should be, be given. Uh, the type of methodologies and prioritization tools being developed will, however, also be used uh, usable uh, for for uh, uh, the 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 newer products being developed, but it was mainly driven by by us assuring that we do the right thing when it comes to legacy products. Uh, pillar number two is about uh, uh, effluent control, um, sharing practices, uh, technical guidance when needed. And we've developed some kind of an industry guidance for effluent control. I'll come back to that. And as I said, finally, uh, the extended environmental risk assessments, which is all about the post approval scheme. So we, 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 we are very clear that the medicines should be authorized based on medical and medical evaluation. But then post launch, we continue to develop the environmental risk assessment and do reassessments. When, uh, when necessary. And by this, we secure that we do not have patient access to medicines. So the IPI project, uh, we, it's, a, uh, it's a project that, that will develop tools that help us screen and prioritize the ex especially the, the existing products or the legacy products. It's a roughly 10 million euro project. Um, and between the industry and the European Commission. It started 2015 or in 2018, and uh, a number of, of, of uh, companies, uh, your companies taking part today in this webinar, are, are already uh, heavily engaged in, in running this project. And of course, also non industry partners uh, like, like the, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, UBA in Germany, which is a, a, a very strong and important stakeholder on this. As I said, we like to develop tools and models that allow us to identify environmental risks early in the development of the medicine. Similar kind of tools and models will also help prioritize and test 
uh, the old APIs that you have for environmental data sets. And you have a, a link there to, to more information uh, on the internet. I, I really recommend you to, to, to follow that up. But if I try to, to very briefly summarize how the, I, uh, the IPI project would address the stakeholder concerns, we believe this is a time and resource efficient way of, of, of addressing the, the uh, legacy products. We cannot just start and, and, and try to develop data sets for all old substances. We talk about thousands of them. Uh, so prioritizing these are, are the, the clever and smart way of doing this. It's, it's together with the European Commission, so it's transparent, includes a variety of stakeholders. And the tools that we develop here will also help us to flag environmental risks earlier within development, not only. So this is valuable not only for the legacy products, but also for, for, for R&D moving forward. We've completed the first year. We have established a database and the model development is underway. And uh, agreed between the different stakeholders uh, to, to the, some of the models. So, so the next step we will populate the database with data and actually start start seeing whether the approaches would work. We'll jump into pillar number two, the industry guidance reference control. Uh, and uh, the the intention here is to to exchange good practices. Uh, between different companies, between the, the, uh, ourselves and our third party manufacturers and so on and so forth. But it also allows both for internal and external benchmarking through what we call a waste of the maturity ladder. And if I describe that very briefly, it's a six step ladder where the first steps are about minimum requirements, which are pretty much on, on legal compliance. Uh, step number three and four are the more advanced uh, type of, of uh, uh, operations where we, ex where we have good assets and, and control of, of uh, different risks. And steps number five and six, the more high level, where we talk about benchmarking and continual improvement. Uh, and this, all this will help us, of course, to improve effluent quality where necessary. Uh, and we hope that this really would, would uh, make environmental sustainability part of our company culture. And there has been uh, already done some efforts to educate uh, throughout the supply chain. One such an example, webinars run in January now within the framework of the Pharmaceutical Supply Chain Initiative, PSCR. Uh, I'd like to stress that this gives us a uh, possibility to take actions uh, in relation to the risks identified. Always once proper risk assessments being being produced. It's important to remember this approach is facility and product specific. Uh, and we also believe that these do increase transparency. Transparency, although, as I stated in the beginning of, of the webinar, still, still some stakeholders that criticize us that the public transparency of, of our supply chain is lacking. And, and uh, if time allows today, I'd like to just have some of your views on if and how uh, that should be, be, uh, be addressed. The final pillar uh, is the uh, post authorization or post approval environmental risk assessment scheme, which we call the extended environmental risk assessment. And there are uh, some, some important part of this initiative. One is that we talk about the total pick. And with that expression, I mean that, that all products contain the same active pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, are assessed. Uh, you, you, you need to assess all that, all the, the total uh, amount of API. And that's a, a, a novel uh, way of, of doing environmental risk assessments. Uh, and 
the extended environment risk uh, assessment scheme would also allow us to, to uh, reflect the latest published research findings, the latest knowledge being generated since we reassess or re refine our environmental risk assessments post approval. So, so uh, I, I guess some of the most important thing here is to review uh, and extend the environmental risk assessment post approval throughout the, the product life cycle when needed. When we have uh, accurate uses features, we could refine the, the environmental risk assessment. Uh, and uh, if uh, environmental risk uh, measures code should be put in place or adjusted, uh, we believe that this is something we as companies need to, to discuss with EMA or the national competent authorities bodies once again post approval. We also believe that it is here we could utilize some of the prioritization tools from IPI to identify uh, gaps, for instance, for, for legacy APIs when it comes to environmental risk assessments that today do not have a full data sets. Uh, so uh, the extended environmental risk assessment scheme allows that uh, risk assessment does not stop with authorization. It, it continues. However, and I want to restate this, uh, authorization shouldn't be stopped based on the extent, um, based on the environmental risk assessments. It's based on compound rather than product. So the total pick, the, the total amount of, 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 of that API, so not only for your product, but for all products. It has a, uh, a potential for cross-referencing, and cross-referencing meaning that one company A have, have, uh, have uh, uh, studies conducted for, for, for their API, and one company B uses the same API for another product. It's an ability to share and cross-reference cross data. Uh, there are some legal uncertainties on this, but it's, it's definitely a way moving forward that would also allow less, uh, less studies that just replic uh, replicating old studies. So some kind of an effici efficiency gain there. Uh, When, when, uh, when it comes to, to uh, risk being identified during authorization or post approval, we, we, we believe it's important that we, we refine our risk assessments and we do not believe it's a proper way when, when a product or a substance or compound being added into the water framework directive uh, regulation before we actually have all that knowledge in place, which the extended environment risk assessment scheme would, would, would help us uh, develop. So, so uh, the, the environmental risk assessment is a, a developed era. Uh, it's, it's a better way of doing these risks, uh, risk assessments, but it ensures patient access to medicines, which is paramount for us. So uh, coming back to this slide we had in the, the, the opening of the, of the Okay, sorry everyone. Um, Bengt has um, a technical issues with his microphone again one second and we'll try to get him back on the line. Bank, you should be back. I'm back. I think I'm back. 
Yep. It's a little bit annoying, uh, sorry for that, but I, I guess I'm back, it looks like that. Uh, as I said, uh, reauthorization of products, uh, retrospective enforcement of ERA testing, some stakeholders have asked for that. We believe the IPI product, uh, project helped us there. When it comes to the environmental criteria part of GMP, we do not like that. We believe the industry guidance for effluent control is, is a better alternative. And the extended environmental risk assessment is our way of, of, of saying, no, the environmental risk assessment should not be part of the authorization decision. It's better to, do, to, to manage these things as possible. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, EPS, uh, we believe is, is, uh, it, it presents and provides a framework of, of good product stewardship, good environmental stewardship. It covers the lifespan uh, of the pharmaceutical product and, which is extremely important for us, it, it does all of this without uh, negatively impacting uh, access to medicines for patients. And with that, uh, I hope you hear me uh, most of the time. Some problems with the audio connection from my side, uh, sorry for that. But uh, I leave it back to, to, to you uh, in Brussels to, uh, to help us run now the question and answer session. Okay, thank you very much, Bengt, for your very useful presentation. We have quite a few questions um, sent to us via chat and quite a few hands raised. So I suggest that we start with the uh, questions asked um, in the chat panel. Uh, the first one, uh, I, I will take them in order, in the order uh, we receive them. Uh, the first one is asked by uh, Dale Aiden. Uh, related to um, the uh, timeline. So um, she's asking if the coalition has engaged yet with the uh, BioIS consultancy uh, and uh, if the EPS initiative has been shared as part of the PI strategy. Uh, the short answer to that, Dale, is yes, but I will let Bengt um, give some more details. Yeah, and uh, yes, we have discussed with with commission with uh, but also with with agencies and with certain people uh, important people key opinion uh, people in in um, in commission and in the agencies uh, we work with with bioias a little bit we haven't met with them directly now uh, uh, but uh, in a meeting with with uh, commission just a few weeks ago we once again presented uh, our approach, shared it with them, and, and uh, also stressed that we believe it's very important that, that the consultant BioIS get a full insight into this proposal uh, while they're, they're writing up the draft uh, price strategy. Thank you. I hope, Dale, that answers your question. Um, I will move on to the next question that we got from Dorota Ayard. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, so she asks, in a previous reports, names of impacted molecules were quoted, such as antibiotics. Uh, most of these molecules are well-established molecules. So her question is, what is the difference in the impact on branded versus generic industries? And who will write or produce reports for the industry? Uh, will brands and generics follow the same report? Yeah, it, it 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 will. It's it's, uh, it's it, there's no difference when it comes to 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 generic or, or branded ones. Uh, it it looks into the compounds as such, uh, mainly. Uh, of course, it's a little bit different when we we talk in in the extended environmental risk assessment. If 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 a product has lost its patent, it's it's kind. It would and and enter into generic uh, uh, marketplace. We have more industry stakeholders, so to speak, to 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 cope with. But but in general, there is no difference between generics and branded products. Thank you. Um, I will get on to uh, another question um, raised by Malte Becker. 
He asks, uh, where do we really stand today? Uh, what is the timeline as well in terms of benchmarking and harmonization efforts related to effluent management? Um, and he asks, where does the stand today, particularly uh, related to sites outside of the EU? Yeah, and uh, the, the, the best answer to that would be based on a survey conducted uh, in, uh, last year. Uh, we reached, reached out to, to several of the member companies of the three associations, got feedback uh, from roughly 30 uh, companies. And, and uh, it's it kind of clear that we, there is a lot of things being done already inside companies, both when it comes to your own facilities, but also facilities, third party uh, facilities. Uh, outside the European Union and there is absolutely room for improvement uh, but we see a uh, we see that initiatives already been been taken and we strongly be believe that that by sharing uh, these experiences by, by addressing them uh, from the trade associations together we we uh, we, we we do really uh, improve uh, over time, and uh, as a, but but as I said, there is a lot of re uh, improvement. But but several of the companies have already started the, the, this journey, and I I really hope that by sharing experience between companies, we could could learn from one another. The, uh, Amber Fanny, we will unmute you. Hopefully, you do have a question. Ambra, can you uh, you can ask your question now? Can you hear me? Yes, but you can speak a bit louder, please. Yes, I would like to know why why that's the reason. That's the we can't hear you very well. Can you perhaps speak with in your microphone? Uh, can, what, about, what about now? Is it yes, better? It's better now. It's better now. Yes. Yes. Why do you believe that uh, an industry guidance for effluent control? Will be a better tool than environmental criteria in GM. Okay, thank you. I I guess I heard the question why I believe it's better with with an uh, industry guidance uh, type of document than than an environmental criteria in GMP. Uh, I I I hope that's the question. I'll respond to that and and uh, come back if if that was not the question. Okay, and um, that's that's one reason. The the main reason, perhaps someone could say, is however that there is a a big respect and an acknowledgement of the GMP regulation. Uh, it's it's uh, everyone agrees that it's okay for for let's say European uh, agency inspectors to go to a third country like India, China, Singapore, Indonesia, wherever U.S. And, and inspect on behalf of, of citizens in Europe, because by securing product quality, we actually secure that patients here in Europe who should eat those drugs are safe. Uh, if we uh, into GMP would add other concerns, uh, it definitely opens up for, for, for discussions on, on trade barriers, uh, it opens up for other uh, regions to to add uh, add uh, different sectors into their GPs that would not be product quality, patient safety related, but but somehow otherwise potentially set up uh, trade barriers. We foresee that that would be a, a large discussion between different regions. If, if environmental standards were added to the European GMP. If, however, I understand in, in a context of, of a discussion with ICH and, and these kind of harmonization type of discussions, if that comes up from, from on the broader global uh, scale, perhaps that uh, our worries about the trade uh, related problems with, with the GMP proposal could be potentially removed. My concern, however, remained that 
that uh, focus is diverted from from the very very crucial point of of, uh, of uh, product quality and patient safety. And hence, I I would rather see uh, industry guidance, but also of course that that uh, different regions inside their own environmental uh, regulation, as we here in the European Union have our industrial emissions directive, that you actually. Uh, secure the environmental practices through the environmental legislation when it comes to manufacturing. Thank you, Ben. Um, actually, unfortunately, we didn't hear the first part of your answer, your first argument. So, if you could quickly repeat that. Well, my first, my first argument is is there is, was the one that I repeated that that it's it's a uh, uh, GMP should focus product quality and patient safety and adding anything else would potentially divert that focus uh, from, from product quality. Perfect. Many thanks. Um, I have a question now from uh, Jason uh, Snape. I'll read it out to you. Uh, he asks, what should be the first stage of transparency for industry within the effluent management work stream? Uh, should it be visible standards and compliance or performance against this standards? Uh, or should it be transparency of what is produced where? So it's really about. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, that that was the question. It's a question on transparency. Yeah, and and uh, as I said previously, it's it's when it comes to transparency, that's one of the things that I really like us to to listen to to uh, to, uh, to all our colleagues uh, around this the, in the webinar today and other places. I, I don't think there is a clear answer on this, uh, Jason. I think people have different opinions. Different companies might have different opinions. Uh, I, I, of course, transparency when it comes to different, uh, different wastewater treatment techniques and other mitigation measures, uh, where we as an industry stand as part of the the uh, result having this survey that we have decided uh, we'll we'll discuss internally uh, at least to start out with uh, when it comes to uh, more openness public transparency of, of the supply chain as such there's definitely a lot of of, uh, of different uh, opinions and and a lot of concerns once again some trade concerns some concerns when it comes to falsified medicine uh, that it would increase the risk for for, uh, for falsified medicines if the, the supply chains become completely open. But also there are people who, who view that until we become uh, more publicly open with with uh, where products are being produced, and uh, we will always be, be seeing criticism from from different stakeholders who believe that we have something to hide. Uh, one one concern of myself is that I do not want us to end up in a situation where people believe that produced in in India would mean that 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 has a a would potentially have more environmental impacts than produced in in uh, the Netherlands, for instance. That there are extreme, there are both good and bad in uh, manufacturing facilities in. Uh, across uh, different countries, across all different regions. So, so if if more transparency is being given to the public, we need to secure an, that they have the understanding and awareness that that it's not only products produced in Europe that are safe. But I'm more than than happy to to hear other one uh, on the webinar today to somehow comment on on the, the transparency issue because it's that's not you do not have a, a very clear one opinion on that developed uh, in the uh, in the industry association okay thank you bank we're um looking at people who have raised their hands in the meantime while people think about the question you threw out to the audience I see that Gabriele Schaeffer has a question. Uh, we'll ask. We haven't muted you, so you can raise your question, Gabriele. Thank you so much. My question is with regard to generics. 
uh, if the originators have provided during their procedure the environmental risk assessment, do we as a generic company also have to submit an additional environmental risk assessment at the moment? Uh, my impression is, at least for Germany, that they are asking each and everybody for an environmental risk assessment, irrespective of the fact if the originator has done it or not. Thank you. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, that, that's the way it works, and and uh, especially if if the uh, uh, if if you if you believe that that you are entering the market will potentially increase the the uh, the uh, the use. Uh, of course, there is some kind of a, a good reason to say that 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 the environmental risk could could change by you entering the market, and that's what I meant when when we dis when we uh, when we talked about the extended environmental risk assessment. That uh, there is uh, for us an attempt to find a way to to uh, to allow for for entering in uh, cross-referencing data and, and by that cross-referencing we do not necessarily at least need to redo uh, studies but it will also look on the total uh, amount of that compound not only your own but the originator, the other generic uh, company and, and uh, even look into would we be able to to join together in some sort of a group of companies consortia or something like that to 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 uh, present one environmental risk assessment that actually uh, take into account all the different products uh, with this same api so so it's it's part of the the uh, the extended environmental risk assessment to find uh, to find ways on on how to do that, and and uh, I understand that Jason Snape is on the the webinar today, and Jason is our uh, work stream leader when it comes to the extended uh, environmental risk assessment. So, if, Jason, if you'd like to add something on where we stand on that and how we hope to find room within the the uh, existing legislation, Jason, you are unmuted. If you'd like to reply. Okay, I will take that as a no. Um, um, Bengt, we have another uh, follow-up question from the audience uh, on the issue of GMPs and control of manufacturing um, effluents. So Dale uh, asks, um, do you think regulators will be satisfied with having guidance versus regulation as regards to the control of manufacturing effluents? And just for uh, a last housekeeping uh, issue, uh, we're almost at the end of this session, so I will. I think we have time for this question and another one, uh, and then I, I'm afraid we will have to to end this session. Uh, no, I do not believe uh, only a voluntary scheme, uh, industry guidance will will be satisfying. We need to find find. Uh, 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 we need to 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 find also a way to 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 secure that proper legislation is in place. And as I said, when it comes to the to the European Union, we have the Industrial Emissions Directive. There's definitely room for for regulating uh, API releases from manufacturing inside the uh, Industrial Emissions Directive. There are environmental legislation. In, in place in, in a lot of countries around the globe who are uh, big producers of, of pharmaceutical ingredients. And of course, we, we believe it's important that, that such legislation is enforced. Uh, so, so having the environmental legislation in different countries regulating manufacturing needs to be enforced. We believe in industry guidance benchmarking and an openness around that would help uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to discuss of course other type of measures but I I'm, do not believe GMP is the proper way uh, since, since that would open up for not only uh, some, some problems around product quality 
for instance, if, if, if inspectors do not pay full focus and attention to that, but, but it might also uh, jeopardize uh, different trade agreements that, that Europe have with, with uh, other regions of the world. Thank you, Ben. So we have time for one quick last question. I see Christine Bouts has raised her hand, so I've unmuted you now. You can uh, ask a really quick question, Christine. Uh, sorry, it would be a little bit longer, but uh, as we lost Bank for the first time, he elaborated on the database which might be up and running by 2018. And then he came with that, what we should not expect. And I was curious what that might be, because as we mentioned beforehand in Germany, uh, B Farm is asking for errors now for each and every substance, even if they are well known and old. Yeah. Um, is that a quick answer? Yeah, that's a pretty quick answer. My, when you lost me, what I'm saying is that do not expect that by 2018, when the IFI project ends, we will have uh, full data sets for all legacy products. Do not expect that. And, and I want to be clear to our stakeholders that that will not happen. What we'll have by 2018 are the tools, the, the, the methodologies to prioritize, the, the, the methodologies, how we are addressing the thing. Uh, and and, and uh, we will know hopefully which ones we will will need which type of APIs we will need to address first. But we will not have full data sets for all legacy products. So that was just I want to, to underline that so, so people do not expect that the IPI project will fill all these data gaps. Thank you, Bang. So with that, I. I'm afraid we will have to close the session because we have run out of the um, allocated one hour slot for this webinar. Ben, thank you very much for a very uh, useful and insightful presentation. Uh, for everyone who is uh, still on the line, we will make the slides available to you after the presentation. Uh, if you have further questions that have not been addressed so far during this webinar, please feel free to send the questions to myself. Um, I will then uh, forward it to Ben and uh, our uh, other experts and we will come back to you with a with an answer to to this to your questions um, so again thank you everyone again for taking your time to to participate on an early monday morning to the webinar uh, i hope you found it useful um, and have a very good monday and a good week thank you everyone thank you bye-bye sorry for the technical disturbances bye-bye <laughs> thank you ben <laughs>